Hello, I'm Jen Uphoff Gray, Artistic Director of Forward Theatre Company. Welcome to our first ever bonus episode of Theatre Forward. We are releasing this as a holiday gift to you, our listeners. This past summer, we produced our biannual monologue festival. The year's theme was Two Steps Forward, and the dozen pieces chosen for the festival all related in some way to Wisconsin's long progressive history. We brought three of our performers into our studio to record their pieces for posterity, and we hope you'll have time to enjoy them amidst the end of the year bustle. My name is Megan Randolph, and this is Cranberry League Stats by Ellen Monroe. Uh, <clears throat> good, good afternoon. My name is Wanda Davis. I've been uh, told, <laughs> I've been asked, um, I have been chosen to give you the results of our recent research on your behalf. I know you're expecting the executive director, but he's been called away on an urgent, um, something urgent. And uh, the assistant director is um, also dealing with something, family something. Um, I was the consulting statistician on your project. My computations and analyses have helped numerous Wisconsin businesses adapt to changing economic and political environments. During spring training, I work part-time for the brewers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh, in the movie version of this meeting, I will be played by Jonah Hill. <laughs> uh, not that there will be a movie version of this meeting. Confidentiality, I assure you. Uh, we've analyzed the census data for the past six years, double-checked our predictions with 10 separate focus groups, and we're ready to answer your primary question, how can the Wisconsin legislature appear to be more diverse and inclusive? <clears throat> um, my notes show that your staff was contacted six, uh, no, seven Yeah, seven times asking for clarification without receiving any. Um, See, your question is phrased as though you don't actually care about being more diverse or inclusive as long as you appear to be. Um, We prepared our results both ways, as though you just needed to appear to make this happen and as though you really wanted this to happen. Those are two different things. Does everyone get that? Well, uh, if you just wanted to appear to be more diverse and inclusive, schedule more meetings with business leaders of color and have someone take your picture, include at least one person in a wheelchair in your campaign ads and have your slogans translated into Spanish. (laughs) No, 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 no. Don't write those things down. (sighs) Look, surely you really want to be more diverse and inclusive. Okay, look, um. The Wisconsin legislature has exactly 132 senators and representatives. The state of Wisconsin has 5.8 million people. Now, currently, 86% of the state's population identifies as white. 94% of the state legislature is white. Now, that's roughly 10 and a half too many white legislators to accurately reflect the state's racial makeup. Uh, 6% of Wisconsin identifies as African American, 4% of the current legislature identifies as African American, so not a terrible miss, but you should strive to, uh, maintain and, and slightly increase that margin, uh, 5% of the population consider themselves to be Hispanic. Only 1.5% of the legislature identifies that way, so you're missing about three Hispanic elected officials. Despite large Hmong, Japanese, and Chinese communities in the state, you have no Asian American legislators, so you need to find at least one. And 168,000 people in Wisconsin are Native Americans, and zero legislators are. So that looks unfair. So the Wisconsin legislature is looking for 10 or 11 people of color and non-white ancestry to accurately mirror the race and ethnic populations it represents. Make sense? Okay, moving on to gender. Um, 
Now, Wisconsin is more than 50% female, and you've got 23% of your governing body identifying as female. Yes, that's a thing. Identifying as female. Welcome to 2019. (sighs) Sorry, the the point is not gender terminology. The point is you're alarmingly short on female representation. You owe us at least 31 more female members to correctly represent the male-female mix in the population. Uh, On to the more colorful stats. 10% of Wisconsinites are left-handed as compared to 17% in the legislature. 4% of the population at large drives a vehicle that can be classified as a luxury car, so 20% of the legislature drives something most of the population can't afford. 67% of the adult Wisconsin population owns a home. 100% of state legislators own at least one residence. 23% of our senators and representatives own two properties, Northwoods cabins, lakeshore cottages, condos out of state. Oh, and this is juicy. 10.8% of the population over 18 has a serious mental health or substance abuse problem. Now, based on newspaper accounts of DUIs and staffer accounts of erratic behavior, I suspect this group is way overrepresented in the current legislature and still isn't getting anything done about the problems. To be more diverse and inclusive, I recommend you drop at least nine left-handers, 21 Mercedes Porsche Lexus owners, about 40 homeowners, and at least two mentally ill slash alcoholic cokeheads. Then you'll have the right mix, but please, let's make sure this mix has talent. There's no point in recruiting a, a, a Manny Machado, you know, even if, if he does up your Hispanic roster. You don't need one more person who won't put in the effort to get to first base unless he knows he has a home run or can kick somebody. You need to add four people who pay more than 50 percent of their income to rent. Add eight single parents who've had to figure out child care while working multiple jobs. Get 20 more parents who've had to, to fundraise and, and, and volunteer and supplement to maintain the schools you've consistently underfunded. Add some meat packers, cheese makers, um, you know, beer brewers, paper mill employees, you know, all those industries we use as representative of our state. How about actually having representatives from those industries, the people who day in and day out get the job done? You need 15 teachers, not administrators, but teachers who have had to deal daily with most of the societal problems that you have helped to perpetuate while insisting their salaries and benefits should bear the brunt of your inability to budget and fund the services you're supposed to supply. You need a couple of scientists from the UW system. See if they can undo the damage done by decimating an education system that serves 170,000 people a year. Explain to them why funding to make sure some future Wisconsinites will have the chance to make Chinese television sets was more important. You need some truck drivers who've had to deal with the half-finished, drawn-out road projects. And you need some dairy farmers who will take the full impact of your partisan dalliance with the federal government. In short, you need to rebuild with desperate people who can pitch ideas, energetic players who can run and slide, and an outfield that does not drop the ball. You need more real people, team players who understand the team is Wisconsin, not a political party. Uh, Now, um, you're probably going to tell me that you can't get these people to run, and... um, I'm going to say right back to you that needing to run is the problem. Real people don't have the money or the time to go through the nonsense of a political campaign, and the time has come to eliminate the practice. We aren't choosing people to represent us. We're going through the motions of exercising the right to pick from two designated hitters put in the game by special interest groups. (sighs) Our findings um, indicate that there is a better way. Do you see these pieces of paper? Each one has the name of a person who meets all the criteria to be a Wisconsin legislator. Glue them to the walls and the ceilings. And then get 132 darts. I sincerely recommend that you throw them in various directions. 
Odds are you're going to hit at least one Asian American. You're going to land on many, many females. You're going to pierce the name of a person with a disability. Odds are you're going to end up with a mix that looks a lot more like Wisconsin. And you can't voice a complaint about the potential for getting someone who can't understand the problems or the system. I have a stat book full of stupid things this legislature has said and done, and I will bet my severance package that this choose by dart group will have a better clue. Hello, my name is Scott Hayden, and this is A New Voice in Politics by Marsha Jablonski. You look, you see me, you think, oh, I know who he is, right? A successful businessman. But with my accent, you also think, ah, uh, must be from Pelly or Quebec. To be honest, am I right? True. But you would be wrong. That is because, you see, English is my first and my only language. I was born right here in our fair state. My real accent? Pure cheesehead. Oh, but how can that be, you ask? I'll tell you how. One night... I have a headache, the monster of all headaches, a very, very bad headache. I take two Tylenol PMs, I go to sleep. I wake up, good, the headache is gone. I shower, I shave, I put on one of my grey suits, a red tie, my Johnson and Murphy wing tips, and I go to the kitchen where my wife, Beverly, asks how I want my eggs for breakfast. I answer, over easy, and what? <laughs> It is the first time I hear my new voice. Bev asks, Are you sure you don't want an omelette or maybe a crepe? Ha, ha, ha. I say to her, I am not fooling around. I am speaking with a French accent, and this time it is not on purpose. Ooh la la, she says. Knock it off, Bill. I protest. She does not believe. I protest. She does not believe. I protest. She finally puts down the spatula, grabs her iPad to Google waking up with a French accent. It's called foreign accent syndrome. Rare, but real. Less than 100 people have been diagnosed with it. I am lucky, no? No. Apparently, I had a small mini stroke. Just a small one. My doctor says eh, the accent will go away. It does not. I go to a speech therapist. It still does not go away. The problem? I am, in fact, a state senator representing the good people of District 32, including La Crosse. I do realize the irony. I was scheduled to be heard by the Senate Judiciary Committee for a bill I introduced banning sanctuary cities in Wisconsin. I am not a racist. The legislation would assist with federal investigations and also stick it to the liberal cities who would face monumental fines if they remain non-compliant, <clears throat> Madison. Except arguing a bill to ban local governments from protecting immigrants while sounding like Pepe Le Pew? It is not possible. My speech therapist, a lovely young African-American girl named Cadence, told me there is one possible method to get my voice to sound normal, to sing. So I try. My normal voice does return when I sing, but I cannot spend my life sounding like I'm living, living in a musical. Although in high school, I was in a musical or two. When you're a jet, you're a jet all the way from your first cigarette to your last dying day. When I told the speaker my plan to sing my argument, he told me to keep my foreign sounding mouth shut and that there would be no singing on the Senate floor. No singing. He was a real dick. This is not my fault. I woke up like this. There are some things in life one cannot control for which we should not be punished. Am I right? As the bill did not pass. I am not bitter. I am not. 
My career? Poof. Well, how can I run again? And now my assistant is texting that ICE agents are waiting for me at my office. They want me to bring several forms of ID, including a birth certificate. I'm sure Bev knows where it is. I have nothing to worry about, right? I was born here. God's country. How could they doubt me? Just because of an accent. She offers a crop key, I'm down on my knees, cause no one wants a fellow with a social disease. My name is Peter Hunt, and this is Butterfly Wings by Coleman. Close your eyes. No, seriously, close your eyes. You're dreaming. Or not. It doesn't matter. Illusion, reality, they're all the same. This is theater, after all. It's supposed to be an illusion. One of us is a ghost. I'll give you a hint. It isn't you. You're dreaming. You're in a modest-sized theater. There's a lone man on stage. That man is me. You are surrounded by strangers. and That's okay. They are people more or less like you. You share much in common. Like the state you live in, Wisconsin. It is night. Of course it's night. You're dreaming. Though there's nothing wrong with dreaming during the day. I did some of my best dreaming in sunlight. Once upon a time. Open your eyes, if you haven't already. My name is Robert. My friends call me Bob. I'm going to ask your name, but I don't want you to say it out loud. I'll hear it if you just think it. That's the way it works with dreams. Let's try it. What is your name? Nice to meet you. Let's get started. As a boy, I was bullied because I was different. That's the way it's always been. Perhaps you know what I'm talking about. I'm not telling you this to gain your sympathy. Being bullied made me stronger. I had to become strong to survive. I'm not complaining. I had some help. A man named William. He lived in the biggest house in town. A mansion, some people called it. He owned... Well, it seemed like he owned everything in town. The big house on the big hill with the big orchard. The big car. The mercantile store. Don't worry if you don't know what a mercantile store is. Every town had one, and it was important. He also owned the zinc works. At least one member of every family in our town and in towns miles around worked at the zinc works. Or they worked the mines that provided the ore for the zinc works. William profited from all of it. Then the mines petered out. There might have been enough ore left in the ground to open new mines, but the market for zinc tanked, much like the market for lead half a century before. The mines closed. The zinc works closed. The town emptied out. By the time everything collapsed, old man Gundry had more than enough money, especially since he had no children of his own. He was the last Gundry in Mineral Point. I always had this love-hate relationship with my hometown. It had a fairy tale beauty that was pure magic from its rolling hills and abundant trees, its star filled skies and babbling streams, to its quaint stone cottages and storefronts. But the people, the people were mean to me, except for William. He saw what I was going through and he understood it. When I was grown, he encouraged me to leave and even helped me do it. I tried London, but it didn't suit me. There I discovered a different kind of meanness, one that looks down on country boys from America's Midwest. William was disappointed when I showed back up in Mineral Point. He urged me to return to London, and I almost did, until I saw the wrecking balls. They were tearing down the old stone houses one by one. The only good thing about this miserable town, in my personal experience, had been these magical abodes. Empty and abandoned now, one by one they were being destroyed. And for a moment, 
I imagine myself a character in a storybook standing in front of the wrecking balls, saving the magic. I could never do it. Not alone. I had the courage, perhaps, but I didn't have the skills. That's when I met Edgar. My Edgar. He was even more timid than I. But gesture by gesture, word by word, sentence by sentence, I drew him out. Embrace upon embrace. Edgar had skills. We restored one cottage. We opened our restaurant and our shop. We restored another cottage and another. People came. Not people from Mineral Point, God no. Our customers came from Chicago, Madison, and from far, far away. William worried for our safety. I did too. What we were doing was dangerous, but I knew what I wanted. We were two men in the 1930s and 40s, living together, fixing up old cottages, running a modest restaurant, and oh yes, an antique shop. We hid in plain sight. We didn't fool anyone, but so long as no one talked about what we were doing behind closed doors, and so long as those doors remained firmly closed, the townsfolk let us live our lives. After all, we brought visitors to this bankrupt town, and visitors spent money. Over time, we saved more houses, even William Gundry's mansion. I'll never forget that day. The wrecking crane cast a dark shadow over the manicured grounds. It had already destroyed one of the outbuildings. I invited everyone I knew, and a lot of people I didn't, to show up that morning. Edgar told me what to say, and magically, it worked. I passed around our favorite china teapot, and when we were done... There was just enough money to buy out the wrecking contract. Orchard Lawn, it's called today, and you can visit it. It's beautiful. You can visit where Edgar and I live, too. It's called Pendarvis. Edgar chose the name, borrowed from an old Cornish fishing village. The state owns Pendarvis now, which means you own it. What is it they say if a butterfly flaps its wings? Toward the end of our lives, Edgar and I couldn't live together. I hated that. We grew too old to keep running the business, and without the business, there was no handy excuse to explain two men sharing a house with one bed. But then, when I was dying, Edgar took me in. My last days were as they should have been. I hear your thoughts. You are worried. A wrecking ball darkens the future of this great state and nation. You've seen more than enough evidence of its power of destruction. You fear for your children's dreams. But look at it from my point of view. If Edgar and I had ever been caught simply holding hands, it would have been the end for us. That's the Wisconsin where I lived my entire life. We were never once allowed to publicly acknowledge our commitment to each other. Today... I can stand on this stage in front of you and tell you that I loved Edgar Hellum and he loved me. If he were alive today, I could get down on my knees and ask him to marry me. He'd probably still be cautious. But eventually, he would say yes. And we would have the most magnificent wedding ceremony ever. We'd hold it at Orchard Lawn. We'd serve Cornish pasties and you all would be invited. And Mineral Point? No longer a ghost town. Almost the whole town is on the National Historic Registry, and it's filled with farmers and artists and shopkeepers and chefs working and living in old stone houses and storefronts. And on certain days of the summer, the streets are filled with rainbow flags. I never in my wildest imagination pictured such a thing possible. That's how much better things are now, for people like Edgar and me. For all of us, really. For you. Close your eyes. The dream is almost over. Close your eyes. And when you open them, things will be better for you too. And for your children. That's the way it has to be. That's the way it will be. Butterfly Wings. 
We hope you enjoyed these original monologues and this bonus podcast episode. From all of us at Theatre Forward, I wish you a very happy holiday season. 